If you, if you haven't seen it, where have you been? Um, but here's what I want to say. Today we're going to talk about um, what God's called you to do and how you find that out. And this sermon came out of um, not just a talent. You know, it's easy to say, what, you know, what are you talented in? But the truth is, it's more than spiritual gifts that that are how God helps you to find your place. And the, this sermon came out of, I was in between sermon series, and I, I had a, a young man come to me with a question. And his question was very simple. He said, what does God want me to do? What, what am I supposed to do? And he really came to me asking a question about work. But as we talked, I realized, you know what? For so many of us, we are focused on work as maybe that's what God wants to do, or even our family, which, of course, that's something God wants us to do. But the truth is God has specifically shaped you and given you a purpose for you to fulfill and, and has made you to do something that no one else can ever do. You know, in the last two weeks, we had 16 people join the church last week. We had five people get baptized last night. We have several more getting baptized this afternoon. And let me tell you something about all that. That's not because of the pastor. I know that's a shocker to some of you. Most of you are like, we knew that. But, but the truth is, you invite your friends and you go out of the way and you are an example. And you're the one that greets somebody. Because here's what I want you to know. When somebody says, who's the minister at your church, most of you would mention my name. If somebody came in the door and said, where's your minister, you would point to me, which would probably be good because they probably have a complaint if they say it that way, right? <laughs> but the truth is, if you're a believer, and by the way, if you're not a believer, I'll talk to you at the end of the service and you can have an opportunity to become a believer today. But if you're a believer, I want you to know something. God wants to use you as a minister to minister to other people. Now I know I'm a shepherd. Not everybody's called to be a shepherd. But everyone is called to minister. And you've been given gifts. So when somebody visits our church. You know somebody greets them. Serves them by greeting them with a bulletin. And somebody set it up a table this morning. And somebody is working in children's ministry. So there's not screaming the whole time during church. Except for some of our adults. And, and right. And, and so they're helping with kids this morning. And, and then some folks set up this morning. You're sitting in a chair that didn't magically appear. And people set up the sound system. And people are singing up on stage. And people are working in the back and helping in all different, using their gifts. And let me tell you something I know. That every one of the people up here and every one of the people back there have a story. And their story includes pain. And their story includes hurt. And if you serve in ministry for any length of time, there are times you will be disappointed. And when you serve in ministry for any length of time, you will have times that you want to give up because you will help people and they won't appreciate it. And that's when you have to remember, wait a second, I'm not serving them. I'm doing what God's called me to do. And so understand, as we look at this idea of shape today, I really believe that God has a purpose for you that's not just about your talents. It's not even just about your spiritual gifts, but it's how God shaped you. And so here's what I want you to know today. If you miss everything else, get this sentence so that if you fall asleep during church and your grandmother calls you, you can say, what was church about today? And here it is. You were shaped by God for a purpose. I got this idea of shape probably 25 years ago from Rick Warren, and I, I think it's just such a good acrostic to remind us of what really matters. But let me look at, look at this verse in Romans chapter 12 about the church. Here's what it says. For by the grace, and that word charis, grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. By the way, I love this word in the Greek, this, this idea of thinking yourself more highly. It would, it's, it's, a, it's insane pride. And for example, like if I came to church today and Carrie came up to me and said, how you doing, Eric? I'm like, I'm great. I'm Superman. And Carrie would be like, ha ha, that's really funny. No, no, no. I flew here this morning. What? Yeah. Yeah. You should have seen me. I had my cape on, came in, changed over. Now I'm just pastor man, but I was Clark Kent. You know what he would do? He would call 911 and say, pastor needs help. He's gone crazy. It's finally happened. And it was Cherie's fault. Um, so... <laughs> I just had to throw you under the bus there, Cherie. So, so here's the deal. So it says, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Don't, don't think you're something you're not. But listen to the rest of it. 
but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. So evaluate who you are and, and what you can do. And we're going to look at that in, in detail. In accordance, listen to this, to the faith God has distributed, listen, listen, to each of you, not just the pastors, not just people you think are more spiritual, God gave you the faith to use your gifts. He's given you the faith for you. And then it continues. For just as each of us have one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. See, in the body, the body has to get along in order, in order to work right. I went and visited Ricky's classroom, and as I visited his classroom, uh, he had a teacher that I've known for over 30 years. We interned together at Park Avenue, and I know things. Anyway, so I said, I'm not telling stories today on you, but, but he told a story about talking to somebody about, they went to the eye doctor, and they got glasses. And by the time the glasses came in, they put the glasses on, and their vision changed. So they went back to the eye doctor and said, hey, these glasses aren't right. And the eye doctor said, let me look. He said, no, no, your vision has changed. You need to go get an MRI. They went in and they had a tumor that was pressing against their optic nerve and messing up their vision. What happened? They had uh, cells in their body that rebelled and attacked the other cells. Listen, that can happen in churches. There are people that leave a wake in churches of destruction. Some of them are in the same church for years, maybe even generations of people who attack People or put people down or create uh, legalism and become religious Pharisees and they push that on the, and they actually destroy the church. And that's why Paul early on says, listen, we are a body. We belong to each other. So what should you be doing instead? Hey, so the cells of the body can attack each other. We've seen that. All of us have. I'm not going to have you raise your hand if you've seen that in churches, but all of us know those people. But here's the real deal. God has given you the ability to build others up, to inspire others, to make others better than they are, and to accomplish more together than you ever could accomplish alone. See, see, all the people who've gotten baptized and all the people who joined our church and all the people who are doing things for Christ and people who are going on the mission trip in a few weeks, all of these people were not just influenced by one person who stands up here on Sunday morning. They were influenced by a whole family of people. And that family partnered together in order to help people feel loved and cared about and have a chair and hear a sound system and have be inspired and, and be able to come before God's presence and worship and, and to be prayed for and to be blessed with coffee. <laughs> and all of those things, you know, God brings us together. Why? Because, listen, can I be honest with you? It's sometimes a pain to be in a family. Because when you're in a family, not everybody does what you want them to do. Did you know that? There are people, they sing songs I don't like. They want to go on, it's a small world. I don't know what is wrong with my family, right? They want me to take them places. They like food I don't like. I sometimes I can't cook fish at my house because I got two kids who are like fish. So I shove it down there. No, I don't. Right? So, so we make adjustments for each other. Why? Because we're a loving, caring family, but we go out of each, our way for each other, but we also use our individual gifts. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What is your shape for ministry? And I love this quote by Rick Warren. You can waste your life. You can use it on personal self-centered things and totally miss God's plan and purpose for your life. In fact, most people do. Your shape is how you discover God's purpose. So here's the things we're going to talk about today. Spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. Number one, or excuse me, how I discover my shape for ministry. Number one, I need to discover my spiritual gifts. Most churches, this is all they talk about. And, and if this is all you talk about, you kind of miss the whole picture. So here it is. We have different gifts according to the grace given, listen, listen, to each of us. So you have a spiritual gift. If your gift is prophesying, which is what I do each week, is telling the truth. It's not just telling the, you know, people think of it as telling the future. It's telling the truth. When you read God's word, it prophesies even to you. But if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. And we have servant people here. Some of you, if you accidentally spilled a cup of coffee, there would be somebody running up here. They're probably carrying a mop with them. I mean, those servant people, they're always doing something for other people. If it's teaching, then teach. 
If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. One of our ladies came up to me and she said, you know, I'm trying to discover my spirit. I don't know why I'm making her sound that way. She doesn't sound like that, but it's kind of fun. I'm trying to discover my spiritual gift. And I said, really? I said, well, what do you think? You know, she's like, I don't, I just don't know. I just don't know. I just don't know. I said, well, as much as I've known you, I, I know at least one of them is encouragement. And she looked at me and she goes, that's what my best friend said. And I'm like, do you not like your best friend or something? Because sometimes you find out what your gifts are by listening to what people are saying. Anyway, so if it's giving, then give generously. Let me say that one again. If it's giving, I'm just kidding. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Discover your gifts. And here's the problem. When people first become Christians, they want to take a spiritual gifts test. By the way, there's tons of spiritual gifts tests online. There's some great ones. I mean, be careful which ones you get. But the ones that follow these motivational gifts are a pretty simple test. Usually 20 or 30 questions. You can take it online and kind of say, oh yeah, I do kind of tend to that. But here's the deal. If you're a new Christian, there's a lot of things you may not have even tried yet. So it's hard to take a spiritual gifts test. Try different things. Do different things. Discover different things about you and who you are. So here's the question today. Am I discovering the gifts God has given me? Number dos. You didn't know we were bilingual. I need to follow my heart. Brothers and sisters, my heart, this word cardia, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites and that they may be saved. So Paul was saying, hey... I have a heart desire to see the Israelites saved. Now, God called him also to the Gentiles, and that was the thing. But he says, hey, my heart is still there. So here's a question for you. What do you care about? What matters to you? Are you one of these people that, that you love to do things like feed the homeless? There's opportunities to do that, by the way, in our community. Maybe you're one of these people that you love music and you love to use your gifts. Maybe you're one of these technical people. Maybe you're an organizational person. What is your heart? What do you care about? Maybe it's children. You see kids and you want to see God work in them. You want to see people have knowledge or, or you want people to have, listen, where does God, what is your heart? That'll begin to show you what God has. So here's a question. What do I love or have a desire to do? By the way, if you serve in ministry, let me caution you about this. I've been at churches where people will refuse to do service that's needed because they say, I just don't feel like doing it. It's not just about feeling like doing it. Can, Neil and I have talked about this. There are weeks we don't feel like showing up for church. That would be a problem. There are weeks that folks who serve here and set up chairs and sing and do other don't feel like doing it. There are weeks that the people who do the coffee don't feel like doing coffee. Thank God they did anyway, right? And so there are weeks that you don't, it's not about feelings, but what's your heart Desire. Number three, not only spiritual gifts, not only our heart, but what are my abilities? Every skilled woman, this is all through the Bible, but this is pretty neat in Exodus 35. Every skilled woman used her hands to make the blue, purple, and red thread and fine linen, and they brought what they had made. And so there were people that skilled in that. And then it continues. Also, the Lord had given, now listen, I'm going to show you something about the Bible. I can pronounce these names, and it would be fun, but this will be more fun. The Lord has given Mr. B, Mr. O, and the son of A from the tribe of Dan the ability to teach others. You didn't know you could get away with that. Next time you're in a Bible study, just do that and go with it. Or you can say, Bezalel, Ohulab, and the son of Ahishmash. Okay? From the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. The Lord has given them the skill to do all kinds of work. They are able to cut designs and metal and stone. They can, I guess they're... Tile setters, I'm not sure. All right. They can plan and sew designs in the fine linen with the blue, purple, and red thread, and they're able to weave things. They're able to do things. You have abilities. You also have anti-abilities. I have some anti-abilities. A little over a year ago, Cherie, was that your friend that did the painting thing? Is that somebody you knew? So, so she, we called this person. They did a fundraiser for our youth, and we had them come in. And the lady, I, I called and talked to her. She said, I can teach you how to paint. I said, no, ma'am, you cannot teach me. How to, oh, no, no. I can teach anyone how to paint. I said, ma'am, I, I am sure that you are awesome, but you don't know. So I went ahead and did it. My mom and I did. And we came, we painted, we, we tried to warn them. My mom and I later burned our paintings. We were afraid someone might get a hold of them and die just from viewing them. 
Here's what the lady said to me, and I think I've ruined her self-esteem now because she came to me and she said, you know, next time you should just take pictures of other people painting pictures. That's absolutely true. My small group came to my house, helped me paint my house. I started trying to help and they took the paintbrushes away and said, no, no, just bring us food. Stop trying to do that. So you have things that, you, that, that other people tell you, no, no, no. But you also have abilities. And, and so things you know how to do, God will use those things. Are you using the things you know how to do? Are you teaching? Some of you are great at working on cars. Have you taught anybody? Have you even pulled a child aside and said, hey, hey, look, let me show you how to check the oil. One of the things we did in Boy Scouts, I'll never forget, Boy Scouts, we took them, I took them out to my car, opened the hood and said, here's the oil here. You would be surprised how many kids have no idea there's even any oil in your car. I know some adults who don't know if there's any oil in their car. Today, some of you may need oil before you leave church. But teach what you know. Teach what you know. How am I developing and using my abilities to serve? So we have people on the computer this morning. They know a little bit about computers. They don't even pretend to know everything. But they know a little bit. So they can make these screens go from one screen to the other to the other. To, where's the pastor? Go back, go back, go back. Where did, pastor, would you follow your notes? You know, okay. By the way, they're very patient with me. Number four, I need to work inside of my personality. Now, God can work outside of your personality at times. Just so you know, there are times where God will use you in an area that you may not be comfortable with. But the truth is, some of you are introverts like me. No, I'm not. Right. Right. Some of you are introverts. And every once in a while, I'll say, somebody will say to me, you know, Eric, I wish you could just be quieter. And I'm like, well, I wish you wouldn't be a jerk. But neither one of us are getting our wishes today, apparently, right? And so, <laughs> that was really a mean thing to do. All right, so 1 Corinthians 12 says this, And there are different ways that God works through people, but the same God. God works in all of us in everything we do. Something from the Spirit, listen to this, can be seen in each pastor. No, it doesn't say that. It says, can be seen in each person. Why? For the common good. God's given you gifts and he has given you a personality so that you can be a blessing to other people. So you might be an introvert, an extrovert. You might be organized. You might be anti-organized. You, you might be creative. You might be people-centered. You might be a problem solver, independent. Some of you love to work in groups. Some of you would rather be alone in a cubicle. Some of you love to, to, to hear inspiration or give inspiration. Some of you are visionary. Some of you are assertive and some of you are compliant. And guess what? It's not wrong who you are. And so God may even use who you are to help other people. So pay attention to how he made your personality. You don't have to be up here on stage to be a blessing. And to be honest with you, most of you are not up here. Have you noticed? So God can use you everywhere. And the reason that people came and visited our church is because you guys at your home went next door or were in a shop or were somewhere else and said, hey, you ought to come visit. You ought to come see. Our pastor's an idiot. You'd be surprised at the things he said. Come visit, right? So however you invite people. Number five, I need to use my experience to serve others. Here's what I know. Your failures... Your failures, your weakness will most often be what God uses to bless others. You think it's about your successes. You think it's about your victories. You think it's about the things you're good at. But the truth is those failures, those hurts in your life. You know how God wants to restore you? One of the ways is when you bless other people, when you've been hurt and you're able to help them when they've been hurt. Listen to this verse. Remember those days in the past when you first learned the truth? You had a hard struggle with many sufferings, but you continued strong. Listen, sometimes you were hurt and attacked before crowds of people. And then listen to what they did because they had been hurt and attacked. And sometimes you shared with those who treated the way. So what happened? They had been attacked. So guess what? They noticed when other people had been attacked and said, hey, we're going to go help them. By the way, some of the best people in your life will be people who have struggled in the way you struggle. And they will come and surround you. And then guess what? You then should pay attention. And when someone's hurting, you go and surround them. That's what this verse is talking about. You even had joy when all, you helped the prisoners. You even had joy, listen to this, when all you owned was taken from, him, from you. God is so good. 
That when you obey him and you follow him, that even if everything is taken away from you, you can have joy. Because you know you had something better and more lasting. So here's the questions for this one. What education experiences, what painful experiences, what ministry experience have I had that could help others? And then finally, I want to finish with this last thought. I heard this at a church in Fort Lauderdale years ago, and I've always liked it. Do whatever it takes to serve others. Now, Jesus washed his disciples' feet to show them what it was like to be a servant. But do you know the other reason that Jesus washed his disciples' feet? This is huge. Buckle up. This is a huge, ready for this huge theological truth? Jesus washed the disciples' feet because they were dirty. Some of you are sitting and going, I wonder what God's purpose is for me. And yet all around you are people who are hurting, are situations that are happening, or even areas that you're good at. Maybe you're skilled at. Maybe God's even blessed you. And you go, huh. Gosh, I don't know why they struggle with that. I've never struggled with that. Well, (laughs) We sometimes have to do whatever it is. Now, it's not comfortable. Listen, here's the problem. I've been at churches where they talk about shape or they talk about ministry gifts, and people go, well, that's not my thing. If Jesus did that, he would have never gone to the cross. When you serve God, it is uncomfortable. If you've been in church for very long and you're still comfortable, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Because when you begin to be obedient to God, it is uncomfortable. It is not always good. There are tough weeks. There are times you doubt yourself. Why? Because you have an enemy who doesn't want you to do anything. He wants you to sit and soak. He wants you to sit and serve. He wants you to sit and soak and run from everybody. He doesn't want you to help and equip and encourage other people. He wants you to hide. Offer your bodies, Romans 12 says, as a living sacrifice. I don't know about you. That doesn't sound fun. Holy and pleasing to God, that is your true and proper worship. It means you keep doing what God wants you to do when it's hard, and that is true worship. When life is tough, when things are difficult, when you say, God, I just can't do it anymore, but whatever you want me to do, I'll do. You were shaped by God for a purpose. My sister came to church when I first started teaching years ago, and she said, I'll never forget, she laughed during the service. She came up to me after she said, Eric, I got to tell you something. I said, yes, Kelly, you have too many children. You're making that face. She said, no, no, i got to tell you something. I know that wasn't you. Okay, tell me what you mean. She said, she said, because I know you and you can't preach like that, that's God. I said, I agree. It's absolutely true. That's what I want you to know about your pastor and what I want you to know about you. That regardless of who you are and what you've done and how bad you failed and how dumb you may feel and, and how broken you may feel, that God wants to use you. And he's shaped you with a purpose and he's given you faith and he's poured his grace into you so that you can take that bucket of grace and pour it out on somebody else. He's equipped you. If you're here today and you're not a believer, I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I know about Jesus. I've come to church. I've done some good things, but I've never surrendered my life to him. Being a Christian isn't just to know about Jesus. It's not just to understand some things in the Bible. It's to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And if you're here today and you're ready to do that, I'll be here after the service. And I'd love to pray with you. And you can say, Eric, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. What do I need to do? If you're here today and the truth is you've been sitting and soaking, life became uncomfortable, you've been hiding, I want to encourage you, begin to ask God, God, would you pour your faith into me and give me opportunities to be a blessing to other people? And he will. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you that you shaped us with a purpose. Father, it's God-given, and I pray you'd continue in our church to pour out your spirit, use us. Father, not because we're worthy or good enough or have it together enough. We are all broken. But Lord, by your grace, you poured your righteousness into us, and we receive that, and we choose to serve and love the people around us. Father, I pray in these final moments as we give that you would bless our offering, that you would bless our time. Bless Aaron today. Father, we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.